Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, really, really great um, that you could make it to beautiful Hamilton. My name is Holger Schunemann. I'm the director of Cochrane Canada. Um, I also chair a department here at McMaster University, and I will be doing the introductions today. Um, I know obviously many of you, not everybody, um, but it will be um, great fun to get to know you um, all over the next couple of days. I, um, I would like to um, um, start with um, something that I pretty much learned yesterday um, late in my life, I think, um, and that is um, um, to start with an expression and um, thoughts about gratitude. I attended a meeting yesterday by, um, organized by the um, evidence-based orthopedics, um, ortho you know, orthopods of all. Anyway, some uh, um, orthopedic division here at McMaster University, um, headed by Maud Bandari. And um, it was a quite um, interesting event um, because the theme was gratitude. So I'll come back to that in just a second. But um, I do that um, um, because I would like to thank the people who have organized this symposium. This has been extraordinarily difficult. Um, um, three people mentioned there, um, Laura Burnett, the managing director of Cochrane, um, Nancy Santesu, who um, um, is the chair of the program committee and has put an enormous amount of work into this, and John Labus, who is sitting there in the back, um, um, the um, associate director of Cochrane Canada. Um, they have worked extremely hard together with this team, Laura um, um, Fullerton, Sarah Colgan, um, Joel Tiller, and um, Alicia um, I'm completing this team. They've worked extremely hard, and I'll get back to that as well, in a period um, that um, is very, very challenging for Cochrane Canada, um, mostly because of timing um, issues, but um, there are a few other um, things as well to consider. I would like to thank them um, for their very, very hard work. I'm coming back to them in a, in a second, as I said, and um, we'll start with a round of applause for them, um, if that's okay. <laughs> Without them, um, we wouldn't be here, and a lot of other things wouldn't be happening. Um, and um, um, as you see, what wouldn't be happening is the program over the next two days. There are other people to thank um, who helped making this symposium happen. Um, they are listed here. This is the program committee that was, um, as I said, chaired by Nancy Santeso. Um, lots of people here in the room um, who you will be able to connect with, and um, the abstract committee um, also listed here, um, headed by Karen Dearness, who I already saw sitting, um, I saw her sitting somewhere there. Um, thanks, Karen, for that work as well, um, for reviewing the abstracts. Um, I would like to thank our platinum sponsor, Cadiff, um, a important collaborator for us, and um, Wiley, a key supporter of Cochrane Canada. Um, in fact, Canada will get free access to the Cochrane Library for the month following the symposium. Um, um, in addition to um, that sponsoring of, the, of, the, um, of our event today. Um, I would like to thank McMaster University for um, really generous funding to allow us to be here today um, and allow us to um, um, follow this hashtag that um, I think was developed two years ago at the previous Cochrane Symposium, maybe a little bit earlier, um, Save Cochrane Canada, and we are still um, in that mode of saving Cochrane Canada. I'd like to thank our department that is now called Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact, um, formerly Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics for the work that they've put in and for the resources that they have um, brought forward um, together with McMaster University to keep the, the center going. Um, and um, very, very importantly, I'd like to thank um, Jeremy Grimshaw. Um, Jeremy's sitting right there. Um, I picked this picture, Jeremy, because um, you're wearing a tie. Um, and there are not that many um, of them. Um, um, but um, um, thank you, Jeremy, for leading Cochrane over a period of 10 years and um, ensuring its successes. The successes are huge. I'm not going to go into every detail here. Um, thanks very much. Um, another round of applause, I think, is definitely. <laughs> I felt extremely honored that um, Jeremy um, had approached me to um, resume or take over, um, resume 
leadership um, of um, Cochrane at McMaster University and become its director. Um, it's a great honor. It's certainly added to my um, work time um, significantly. Um, and it came a little unplanned. Um, it came unplanned because I was just on a sabbatical. Um, you can just imagine how that feels, um, being on a sabbatical and having a new big task. Um, we moved the center here in April last year. And um, um, following that, um, it was a, a interesting period of recruiting staff, um, our wonderful staff. Really, we've been extremely fortunate. I mentioned the people and showed you pictures of them. Um, once again, with the help of, um, of Nancy and John, um, making sure that um, um, we are actually able to have this symposium take place here today. Um, there are, Cochrane Canada obviously is um, um, more than the center. Um, um, the center is just there to coordinate and help with activities. Um, there are lots of groups um, there are the, um, 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 that um, are comprised of editorial units, the ch uh, child health field, um, Canada Francophone, the methods groups, um, they are all listed here um, on that particular slide. Um, we will make um, sure that this is um, better visible in our printed material. Um, um, I think it's just a projection there, but I would like to thank everybody who's um, pulled together uh, in, this, um, um, in this time to make um, 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 Canada, um, Cochrane Canada successful and keep it successful. A few facts about Hamilton. You came to Hamilton. Um, this is actually a beautiful town. Um, Listen, listen, it is a really great town. Um, it's only about 40 minutes to the International Airport in Toronto. Um, very easy to reach, great, um, great connection. Lots of people from Toronto are actually working here or moving here um, because it is so wonderful. Um, our nature is great. Um, uh, um, just so that you know, some of you, I know that there are some international attendees where you actually are. Um, you're about here. Okay, um, you are right in Hamilton, located between Toronto, that is um, just a little bit above there. I can show this with my mouse, but I, well, you're able to see that. Um, and um, Niagara Falls, which is not labeled, but um, some of us live in, Ni in Niagara Falls. Um, for instance, Nancy Santeso, um, it's here, there, about there, okay, just north of Buffalo. That's where the beautiful Niagara Falls are, but um, um, a fun fact that many of you will have not known is um, that um, um, Hamilton is also the birthplace of evidence-based medicine and problem-based learning. Um, and more importantly, it's the waterfall capital, okay? Niagara Falls being down there, Hamilton is the waterfall capital. Um, there are over 100 waterfalls. You can actually look this up. Um, this is true, it's from Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> Um, and um, um, I advise you to explore these waterfalls, um, beautiful night skies. Um, this is on one of my bicycle rides. You, can, you should feel free to join me. Um, that's me. I'm pretty um, exhausted. There is a terrible picture. Um, but um, you can join me. I have a number of bicycles that I can rent out. Um, um, you can take one of them. But um, um, to be honest, you should actually make use of our... Um, wonderful social bikes in Hamilton um, to explore these waterfalls. They are available everywhere if you really want to explore the city. Be careful. Um, the drivers may not necessarily be um, um, yet that familiar with bicycles in the town. Um, um, but um, make use of it. And then um, finally, Hamilton has a few other things to offer. If you're interested, um, please do visit our website um, um, that provides more information. I'm coming back to um, 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 Cochrane and um, the busy times. So I would like to ask you to excuse any mix-ups in the program, some, um, any logistic issues as they may arise. I hope there will be none, um, but it has been an ex extremely busy time. Timing um, um, has been not on our side necessarily because um, this particular grant opportunity, many of you will know that, is one that we are applying for that we think is ideal for Cochrane. Um, it's a CRHR grant on guidelines and systematic reviews. We've created a network that we call Cochrane Plus, um, patient-partnered guidelines, user-driven systematic reviews is plus, and um, we've um, um, essentially brought together a group of um, um, over 100 investigators and um, dozens of partners that will help us 
um, hopefully successfully competing for this grant opportunity to once again um, save Cochrane Canada with regards to um, its funding structure and uh, moving ahead and becoming even bigger and better. Um, the funding deadline um, happens to be just two days after the end of the workshops of this symposium, our Living Systematic Review um, workshop that follows. So um, 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 very, as I said, um, a very busy time for the team working on both the grant and um, the symposium, obviously, symposium program. But um, we are keen to get this um, application submitted. Um, we think we have a we have a really wonderful program to go forward and um, will um, successfully compete for for this um, for this opportunity. So funding deadline May 15th, um, um, really for submission official May 16th. So and you will be um, likely talking about this with our um, organizers here. Um, gratitude. Um, I learned this also yesterday from from um, um, from Moet. So um, given these busy times, everybody is working extremely diff um, um, extremely hard. Um, but what I learned is that if you take a positive attitude and you feel grateful for being busy. Um, you are actually doing better. Uh, you are doing better with regards to thinking about life as a whole. Um, the upcoming week, these are positive scores. You have less physical symptoms and um, you get more hours of exercise in. Anyways, um, we'll see if that's true, as opposed to if you look at life as a hassle or you fear events, events such as this. So back to the symposium. Um, um, the symposium actually has an interesting program, as you all know. Um, I'd like to um, um, just describe to you who is here today. We had over 120 registrants. Um, obviously, the focus of this um, symposium is um, the science that is being presented, but it's also about networking and planning. Um, Cochrane's um, future, obviously. We had um, over 70 submitted abstracts, um, about 56 of them will be shown here. We have uh, a group of wonderful speakers, get back to that in just a second. We have um, um, 22 posters, 31 orals, and um, six workshops with, um, and four educational sessions that um, you will be able to enjoy. And um, 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 one of the people who couldn't be here today um, is um, Mark Wilson. Um, we have a brief video from Mark. Um, um, it's a self-made video, so um, whoops, um, let's just make sure that we, can, um, that we can appropriately show that there. Mark Wilson, the CEO of Cochrane Canada. Um, uh, Mark um, um, has this message for us. We'll play it quickly. Hello. I'm sorry I can't be with you for your meeting in Hamilton, Ontario, for the 2017 Cochrane Canada Symposium. I wish I could be with you, but unfortunately it's not possible. But I wanted to record this message of, of support, uh, particularly given the subject of your meeting. Evidence and impact, engaging consumers, practitioners, researchers and policy makers lies at the core of Cochrane's new mission uh, to make sure that we not only produce the highest quality evidence in health and healthcare, but also that we make sure that that evidence is translated into policy and practice amongst the many stakeholders who want it and need it to make better healthcare decisions. We believe that uh, Cochrane Canada is going to play a vital role in the future of, of this effort, as it has done in the first 23 years of Cochrane's life. Cochrane Canada has been central to the growth and development of Cochrane's work around the world. And I want to reach out and thank all of those gathering together in Hamilton this week for all of your efforts in the past and in the present and in the future. Because we know that this week not only marks your meeting together in Ontario, but also the submission of the new CIHR SPOR uh, grant around guidelines and systematic reviews. And that in turn, we believe will open a new chapter for Cochrane Canada if the grant is successful and we're able to establish a new platform and way of, of establishing uh, Cochrane evidence into policy and practice for uh, decision makers across Canada. We've supported this, uh, uh, this bid with letters of support in the last week, just as we've supported Cochrane Canada's groups with 360,000 uh, UK pounds over the last year to keep them going until we hope uh, the new grant uh, can be won and the money comes through. 
So these are important days for all of you in, in Canada. We wish you our very best both in the next few days as you meet together and with the submission of the grant and, uh, and for all the work that will come after that. So once again, have a great meeting and I look forward to working with all of you in the coming months and years as we open that new chapter together and uh, Cochrane Canada looks forward to, um, to a, a bright and successful future. Bye bye. That's good. So um, thanks to Mark. Yes, um, lots of support for um, us going forward for um, um, once again making the symposium happening and, and getting us all together here today. Uh, um, in addition to our application for the SPORE grant, um, um, we believe that um, our colloquia um, or symposia such as this one uh, will be um, equally successful in the future. Um, well, we presume that it will be successful this time around, um, but um, looking at you, it will be successful. Uh, we have um, um, engaged in a number of um, stakeholder reach outs, um, uh, meeting with really the, um, what, can I, what can I say, the decision makers in Canada, that's probably the right, um, the right way to describe it over the past um, um, year and a half and um, are receiving extremely positive signals that um, will once again um, help us to um, have these symposia and keep Cochrane Canada um, as successful as it has been. Um, so back to the symposium. Um, um, so we will start with a plenary um, and I'm about to introduce um, Nancy Santeso. Um, the plenary start at 9.10 today. Um, I'm not going to go through the full program because you all should have a program in front of you. Um, but it is a two-day symposium followed by two days of a living systematic review workshop. And um, um, tomorrow morning, um, the president of McMaster University will come and um, um, speak to us um, for a little bit. Um, probably say something about this building. Otherwise, I will do that tomorrow morning. I just didn't want to take um, away from the um, from um, um, his um, um, deserving uh, um, um, comments because he's been obviously critical in getting this building downtown here. Um, otherwise, I'll tell you a little bit about this building tomorrow morning. Um, um, once again, starting with um, Nancy, Sante uh, Nancy Santesa's chaired session now. Um, the audience for us is really, as uh, Mark also indicated, um, patients, citizens, clinicians, health professionals, policymakers, and researchers. And in this context, all of these different audiences um, need one thing, and that is um, um, evidence in the age of alternative facts. I think um, Nancy invented that, and I think it's a wonderful title. Um, I hand over to Nancy as um, chair of the program committee to open the first session. Thanks, Nancy. So welcome everyone. Um, this is the first plenary session and um, as, I, as we said, we, I was the uh, chair of the program committee, which was a really great committee. One of the uh, ideas that bubbled up when we were talking about these plenary sessions was of course a very hot topic today about evidence in the age of alternative facts. Um, so we have some really, I won't spend a lot of time um, on myself, but uh, we have really three great speakers and they will be speaking about the use of evidence or maybe the lack of use of evidence um, in certain populations. So we have someone speaking about the practitioners and researchers. Um, someone will be also speaking about um, the decision making at a policy level and um, health policy. And we also have someone speaking about um, the health of our communities in public health. So that's really great that it's covering all of our, our audiences together. Um, the way that we thought we would run the session is that we would have everyone, uh, all of our speakers speak uh, first and then um, have some time for discussion afterwards. And I would really welcome everyone to, um, if you have questions, please um, um, voice them. But then I also think we're a nice sized group that if you have any comments or any of your own experiences, this is a nice time to be able to share since we we, we aren't a very large group, so that's really good. Um, and I think, is that, a, I think that's okay then? And I think at the end of the session, um, before you go for the break, we'll just have a little uh, blurb, and this is a bit um, impromptu. The people that are doing the workshops, we have a lot of um, education sessions this afternoon, which are um, a nice feature. Um, we'll just have maybe them come up and um, describe the workshops for you too. 
Um, so that'll be good. Okay. Okay. So that's good. Okay. So Paul, Paul is our first speaker. Um, he uh, is the co-coordinating editor of one of the Cochrane groups based here in Hamilton. Um, so it's the Cochrane Upper Gastrointestinal and Pancreatic Diseases Group. Um, he's also the director of the Division of Gastroenterology, also at McMaster. And he has quite a bit of experience working with um, guideline groups. And um, so he'll be speaking about that. So Paul? Right, now I'm organized. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in Hamilton where I work, but this month don't spend much time in. Uh, and I've been asked to give the practitioner's point of view of the evidence of evidence in the age of alternative facts. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, uh, none of these relate either to the upper GI tract or anything that I'm talking about today. And alternative facts comes from Kellyanne Conway. Um, she first coined this term uh, less than a year ago. And uh, uh, it's not surprising as she is the spokesperson for a president uh, that never gets, uh, lets facts get in the way of his prejudices. Uh, and obviously this has caused some consternation uh, amongst certain members of the community uh, who uh, are uh, more wedded to uh, evidence including our Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, who believes in climate change and other scientific things. Uh, so when, what is heartening in the US is when he did get elected, clearly many Americans didn't agree with this position, uh, indeed crashed the Immigration uh, and Citizen website uh, that uh, night. Um, and. Clearly, a lot of Americans do believe in the Canadian way of doing things and in, in evidence, including apparently uh, the president's daughter. Uh, so, you know, there are some people who uh, do believe in evidence uh, uh, and use it. And I just want to give you uh, uh, examples from a practitioner's point of view of how this can happen. And the main focus of the use of evidence is the use of grade. Uh, developed by Gordon Guyatt and particularly Holger Schoenemann here. Uh, and of course, a whole group of people throughout the world uh, developing uh, this uh, 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 system of assessing evidence for, particularly for guidelines. And um, I've been trying to persuade various GI societies to uh, take this approach. And the first time I got the opportunity was when uh, the American College of Gastroenterology asked me to do this for, uh, well, asked me to be a methodologist on the irritable bowel syndrome uh, guidelines. Um, and at the time, uh, there was a student, uh, a, a resident who came on a fellowship, Alex Ford, who helped me with all of the work I will present related to this guideline. At the time, I thought this wouldn't be a great opportunity to show how grade works because um, this has been done before, the evidence was there, even Cochrane reviews, so what were we really going to show? So I told Alex that they were paying us to do this, it would uh, uh, generate some research income, uh, but don't get too excited by it, I'm not sure this is the right guideline to, uh, uh, to show people the value of grade. Um, shows how much I know. This work has been cited about 2,000 times and uh, has changed things. Um, the first inkling that things might be uh, uh, more useful than I thought was the rival organization. The U.S. has a rival G organization, the American Gastroenterology Association. Their president wrote in an editorial about our guideline that... Uh, you know, IBS based on meta-analyses, it really wasn't on meta-analyses, but that was his interpretation. We are equally convinced they should not. So uh, he criticized us uh, collecting a group of studies together to show effects where the quality wasn't there. Uh, but uh, Gray really showed us something different. So just as an example, uh, and the NICE guidelines would suggest um, uh, uh, 
that high fiber diets should cease in IBS. That was their view, and NICE is a, uh, a pretty good organization. Uh, but we showed that actually, if you look at soluble fiber, there is an effect that whilst these trials were old, they were methodologically rigorous, most of them, not all. Uh, and if you just restricted it to the low risk of bias trials, you still saw a treatment effect. Uh, people were not focusing on grade and focusing on the fact these studies were old with old definitions and therefore must be bad. Uh, we were vindicated by a larger randomized trial the following year done in primary care which showed exactly what the systematic reviews showed which was that the number needed to treat for soluble fiber was six with BRAN being ineffective. Now I don't have any data to show you but I, anecdotally most of my patients have tried psyllium uh, whereas when I first came here uh, that was rarely done. Uh, the other highlight of this would be um, antidepressants, which um, if we look at the previous guidelines by this group, they said there was, uh, it was no more effective than placebo at relieving IBS. Indeed, all guidelines said this. Uh, when we reviewed the evidence, uh, it was pretty clear they were effective. Again, low risk of bias trials confirm this. SSRIs also worked, but the evidence was strongest for tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, actually with a very impressive number needed to treat. Uh, so when you do proper systematic reviews and assess the evidence carefully, you can show that uh, a treatment works um, even uh, um, when perhaps each individual trial doesn't give a clear answer. Uh, and here I do have more than, slightly more anyway than anecdotal evidence that this changed practice. So uh, in the uh, years before this guideline was released, uh, tricyclics were rarely used in gastroenterology. Uh, oh, hmm. uh, sorry, I must have missed that slide. But basically, uh, now evidence shows that they are used in about 60% of functional GI cases um, in a survey done of practice in the US. So a dramatic increase from what was used before. Uh, so that was the start of GRADE being used in GI guidelines and are now used much more widely. And at this point, I'd like to highlight that this is thanks uh, to my uh, joint coordinating editor, uh, Gregorius Leontiadis, but also a very uh, dedicated team led by Karen, who you've also heard today, and Kathy, who does a lot of these uh, systematic reviews with us, and uh, Francis C, who also uh, does those. Uh, and our latest addition is Kieran Elliott, um, who is uh, working very hard with us. Gregorius is also chair of the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology Practice Affairs Committee. Uh, this is the Canadian GI uh, Guideline Committee, so he's in charge of commissioning guidelines and also how they are conducted. So, of course, he's in a great position uh, to uh, move the Canadian guidelines to a more grade-focused uh, um, process. So the first thing to say is that the Canadian Association of Guideline members and the committee choose the most appropriate guideline according to uh, transparent methods. Once the um, topic is chosen, the guideline group is chosen, uh, they formulate uh, the questions that are going to be asked. Uh, the UGPD group uh, then do a search strategy for all the relevant data on each question, uh, provide references that are loaded on software, statements are developed, and then grade quality criteria assessed by two uh, members of the UGPD group independently. This is the website they are uh, loaded up onto. So the advantage here is that as guidelines are updated, uh, we can uh, simply update the reference list rather than starting from uh, scratch as uh, had been done previously. Uh, this is, having first criticized this, the American Gastroenterology Association have also 
uh, been persuaded this is a good idea uh, and have actually uh, had methodologists support all their guidelines. They have four methodologists, uh, one for each guideline, and two of those four are Gregorius and I. So a strong influence uh, on the American Gastroenterology Association guidelines as well. Uh, so, if we look in recent times, um, we have uh, published widely in GI journals. Um, uh, this is, doesn't include the IBS guideline I talked about before, but they've been cited pretty widely given that they haven't been around that long. And gastroenterology, for example, has an impact factor of 16. So these are high impact uh, uh, papers. More importantly, they have made the cover on, on many occasions. Uh, which, again, is unusual. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, most uh, importantly, it actually tells Americans what Canada looks like, and at least where Toronto is, although not Hamilton. Uh, but I just want to uh, talk about... Um, how do I get it back? Oh, I can't do this. Uh, so... The, one of those cover articles was pancreatic cysts. And rather than make this a sort of warm, fuzzy talk, uh, I also want to talk about the challenges of this sort of rather linear guideline approach. Because we know from other evidence, as uh, John and others will tell you, does not always translate into a change in practice. And perhaps uh, pancreatic cyst management is a good example of that. So this is a guideline I was involved with. Uh, there is a pancreatic cyst there. Now I know why you had difficulty showing Niagara Falls, Holger. But there we are. Um, uh, and the problem with pancreatic cysts is that sometimes they can be limb malignant, but imaging is not very good at uh, uh, demonstrating that. So here are two pretty identical uh, uh, cysts. I know you're not radiologists, but these really do look identical. Uh, one is completely benign the, on the bottom there, and the one on the top is uh, something that could be potentially malignant. But of course, if your imaging can't tell you that, that is a problem. Uh, so previous guidelines have tried to develop uh, expert opinion uh, on how these should be managed. Um, basically, uh, Sendai is the most famous, and they're very upfront. They say this is consensus-based rather than evidence-based because we don't have the evidence. There are no randomized trials. Uh, evidence is poor in this area, so uh, white men, old, usually old men, can get together and uh, make a decision on the basis of what we think. Uh, but the AGA, in their wisdom, uh, felt that we could do better, and so produced their own guidelines, which I was a part of. And I'd like to thank uh, the authors who also helped, of course, with this guideline. So um, the key approach I took relates to something Holger has said for a long time, that even when you don't have randomized evidence, you do have evidence. And that evidence can still be quite strong. Uh, after all, we know that jumping out of a plane with a parachute is better than without. We don't need randomized trials to show us that, but there is other evidence that can lead us to that conclusion. And one is just looking at what is the risk of malignancy of these cysts. So we did a systematic review of the literature and found six MRI studies where they were doing MRIs for screening, not for, particularly for pancreatic pathology. Uh, and the overall prevalence of cysts in the general population that are screened just at random is about 15%. Uh, obviously, most of these were small, but some were large, and uh, as you might expect, an increasing prevalence with age. So cysts are common. Uh, if you look at the US database for um, how common pancreatic cancer is, uh, if you look at cyst cancers, um, then that's extremely rare, but they're not well recorded in the SEER database. So perhaps a better thing is to look at just any malignancy. But if you look at the uh, incidence of malignancy in a given age group and the incidence of cysts in that age group, you come to the conclusion 
that only about 0.25% of cysts at most can possibly be malignant. We can then triangulate that with uh, data that we have from uh, authors that have published series on pan uh, um, pancreatic uh, cyst uh, outcomes with follow-up. So there are 22 studies with about 6,000 patient years follow-up, and we can calculate that the invasive cancer rate during follow-up is about 2.24% per year. So pretty rare. So on the basis of that, we felt that for most cysts, just once every other year surveillance with an MRI, uh, rather than the very intensive surveillance that Sendai was recommending with uh, MRIs and ultrasounds every six months, uh, was a better way uh, to do this because the malignancy uh, potential uh, was low. We also looked at, well, let's look at it the other way. When you actually decide to do surgery, what is the prevalence of uh, cancer in this, uh, in this group? That you actually find cancer when you remove the cyst. Here we have 27 studies, uh, nearly 3,000 patients, and roughly 15% had cancer when the cyst was operated on. Now, some of these patients had total pancreatectomy, and most of them had a substantial part of their pancreas removed. This is associated with a 2 to 6% mortality, and obviously serious morbidity in those that survive the operation, many of whom have diabetes and other complications. All for a 15% risk of developing uh, cancer. In other words, 85% did not have cancer. Now, to be fair, some, roughly another 15%, had high-grade dysplasia, so may have developed cancer in the future, but even that 15%, not all of them, would have done. So most people were getting serious operations for benign diseases. And you can predict this from what we know of the accuracy of endoscopic ultrasound, which is probably one of the more accurate tests for this, with a fine needle aspirate. This is a systematic review done by others, which shows an ROC curve. Uh, so our belief, practitioners knowing this, will choose a high specificity uh, before they decide to operate. And if you uh, go on that curve at the most highly specific area, you will predict that you would, predict, you would potentially find 15% um, a malignancy uh, if the overall prevalence was 0.25%. And you would miss 0.21%, uh, in other words, the background prevalence uh, incidence in the population. So basically, these data triangulate very well with our overall SEER database and MRI studies on the, on the prevalence of cysts and the known poor accuracy of uh, the non-invasive tests we have. We also show that, you know, Surgeons said we had, we had, we had over, sorry, underestimated the risk of cancer in these cysts because we were using poor studies. By the way, they were their studies, so that tells you something. Uh, but um, uh, I've showed you, if you do the math with uh, a pancreatic cyst cancer rate of 2.5%, you get uh, data that has never been shown in the literature before, so can't possibly be true. And What's worse is even those that cancer was operated on, presumably early, it was mainly lead time bias uh, uh, um, that uh, led to apparent increased survival. Because if you look at, this is all pancreatic cancers, this is pancreatic cyst cancer. There is an improved survival at, at five years, but by year seven, uh, it's exactly the same. Suggesting this is probably just lead time bias in any potential uh, survival benefit from these patients. So basically, you're not doing much good at all. So for that reason, we recommended much higher threshold before you operated, where Sendai was really encouraging you to operate um, as soon as you were at all worried about cancer in the cyst. So uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine, nothing to do with the guideline, but they did do an editorial on this congratulating us uh, on um, the guideline and for recommending less aggressive care. Holger uh, wrote an editorial, we're very grateful to him with us, uh, on these guidelines uh, in that uh, issue where they were published. Uh, but nevertheless, we got a lot of backlash. And uh, here's one author basically saying we're not evidence-based. 
never gave any reason why we're not evidence-based. It was obviously just angry that uh, um, we, uh, we are recommending less aggressive treatment. And I think more, what disheartened me the most was that I went to Mexico late last year to present to their GI society. And uh, this is where mainly the customer pays. It's a free market system. No one can afford uh, no one can afford surgery, let alone MRIs. And yet, once I finished my speech presenting this data and other data, they all got up to ask how can they get more money to do more uh, MRIs, ultrasounds, and more surgery on these uh, cysts. Hadn't listened to a word I said. Uh, which is not always a bad idea, but in this case, was a bad idea. So, um, I'm perturbed as to why, but Jim Scheiman, one of the authors of this guideline, gave a quote which explains it all. Beautiful quote by Upton Sinclair. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon him not understanding it. And that's exactly right. This is why it is so difficult. Uh, basically, surgeons and uh, radiologists depend on um, screening as much as possible uh, for their income. And so they're not going to believe any data that shows them otherwise. So what I think, and I've given you anecdotal evidence for that, is that guidelines are useful sometimes and can sometimes uh, change practice. In the example I gave you with IBS, there were no good treatments. So we showed practitioners there were some. And they're very happy to use them. They're cheap, easily accessible. Why not? And so that gets uptake. But uh, the system is generally conservative, with built in inertia. And if you're, prof if you're threatening the healthcare professional role, not just doctors, any healthcare professional role, in any way, there'll be a lot of resistance. And that's why you need to engage patients and policymakers really to make a difference in many areas, and you'll hear from them. Uh, next, but hopefully with the three of us, we can eventually move people to the Canadian way of thinking, which is evidence-based medicine. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, next, we'll hear from John Lavis. I think he's at the back there. Uh, so as Holger said, John is the uh, Associate Director of Cochrane Canada, but he's also uh, a lead in the Health Policy Liaison Office um, based here at McMaster uh, as well. And uh, he will be speaking about decision making and uh, alternative facts for policy decisions. Thanks very much. Policy always goes last, so I'm, I, I get to go before Maureen for a change, so thank you very much. Uh, so this is the public policy uh, view, so uh, no disclosures. People also don't call me spicy, but I'll tell you that this podium, for those of you who've seen Melissa McCarthy do an imitation on, of Sean Spicer on Saturday Night Live, this podium's on wheels, just like hers, so if you ask any tough questions, I can get right to the back of the room and mow you right down, so just uh, be kind to me when we come to the Q&A. Uh, so the overview of the talk, uh, I guess the first comment is, uh, in an age of alternative facts, the importance of keeping it all in perspective, and I'm going to talk about three things. So one, in the world of public policy, evidence has only ever been a small part of what drives policy, so we shouldn't have overly ambitious uh, goals to start with. Second, the relative importance of evidence in policy making waxes and wanes over time in, in a given jurisdiction. I'm going to give you some examples in Canada and in the US. Uh, and even in an age of alternative facts, uh, there's evidence in some areas that isn't contested. Uh, there's different values that can open the ways to evidence. There are some areas that are off the radar and people can keep doing what they're doing with using evidence. And there's other areas that have hard to change rules uh, about the use of evidence. So there's a lot of reasons why, to use Paul's language about inertia, there's a lot of reasons why if the system has been using a lot of evidence in the past, it takes a fairly long time uh, to dismantle it and new governments come into place and uh, they can often counterbalance what uh, happened before. That said, uh, what I did was, in preparing for the talk, I went back to three slides that I sometimes use. One that I just put together about 10 days ago, 10 lessons that we've learned from more than a decade of supporting evidence-informed policymaking. Uh, second thing was Cochrane's new KT strategy, which was just, I understand, approved 
at the Cochrane meeting in Geneva a little while ago, and Denise, who's here from the University of Alberta, co-led that work. Um, and then finally, uh, I reviewed how we currently have decided th uh, to describe how the McMaster Health Forum, which, as you heard from Nancy, functions as the policy liaison office for Cochrane, how we describe our work. And I asked the question, if, if we were functioning in Trump world, uh, what would that mean uh, for our work? And initially I thought, oh, it's not too bad, but by the time I, I've completed the analysis, I was feeling pretty sad about the whole situation. So I'm gonna talk to you about uh, why it's so fundamentally threatening. But let's start with keeping it all in perspective. So uh, the, the positive side of the story. So for those of you who've encountered political science, you might know the Kingdon model and the 3I model, but for those of you who don't, um, the governmental agenda, which is a huge long list, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of items that the government's paying attention to just in the area of health, usually all that it takes to get on that list is a compelling problem, lots of deaths from opioids, for example, or politics. So new premier, new government, uh, change in the political mood, that kind of stuff. And the problem piece gives you a way in for evidence. How big a problem is, is it getting bigger or smaller over time? What are the causes of the problem? But the decision agenda, the really small list of items that the government has decided to move on, which in health at any given time is relatively small, uh, to get onto that agenda, you need three things. You need to be convinced there's a compelling problem and you understand its causes. You need to have a policy that the government sees as potentially workable, and the politics have to be right. So there's certain things that would happen with a Justin Trudeau as premier that would never happen with a Harper, sorry, as prime minister, which would never happen with a Harper as prime minister, and vice versa. So you need all three of those things. Evidence helps you with two of them, the problem and the policy piece. When you come, though, to actually making a final choice, what in political science is often called policy development, we tend to use a different framework, the 3I framework. So here we say that uh, you know, governments, when they're making decisions, are constrained by a set of institutional rules, government structures, the fact that our federal government has very little control over health care, the real powers with the provinces, policy legacies, like, for example, 30, 40, 50 years ago, we decided to treat hospital-based and physician-provided care differently from everything else. Those make it really hard to change. And so it's not surprising that Trump said, gee, didn't realize health care was so complicated to reform when he ended up in power, because it is really complicated to change a system that has been in place for a long time with a set of government structures. Uh, second thing that's important is interest. So different groups want different things. And you heard just a few minutes ago about even in the gastroenterology uh, community, you have these two different groups that are vying for people's attention, let alone all of the other groups out there. And then finally, we have ideas. And political scientists typically distinguish between knowledge and beliefs about what is and research evidence like Cochrane Review is hugely helpful there, and values about what should be. So right now, the United States politics is dominated by a group whose values are more market-based, less taxes, always better. It's not about the evidence. It's about those values driving all decision-making. And then we also typically include a plus E, the external events, things happening outside the health sector that can have an impact. So those things have big effects. So evidence is just one piece into that puzzle. So we think it's critical that it be at the table, but those other factors are gonna be hugely important. So one thing, evidence only a small part at any time. So it might be worse under a Trump regime, but it's never uh, perfect. It's always going to be the case that in democracies, other factors trump. There's a bit of a parallel here uh, to the world that Paul was describing. So some of you will know that evidence-based medicine pyramid, the clinical context, the values and preferences of patients, and then research evidence. Uh, at the policy level, you'll see how I've mapped that onto the 3I framework. So the analog of clinical context for us as institutions, the values and preferences are the interests, and the research evidence is sitting there alongside values. So some parallels. Second thing is the relative importance of evidence in policymaking waxes and wanes over time in a given jurisdiction. So in Canada, 
So at the federal level, to use one example, its relative importance in the health field was down under Harper. Harper, when he tackled health issues, almost always picked them as cleavage issues, ways to mobilize his base and to frustrate people that didn't agree with him. Trudeau talks a lot about using research evidence. It's not clear that Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada have significantly upped their game yet, but he talks a lot about the importance of using research evidence. In the US, the use of evidence was way up under Obama, probably the most evidence-based policymaking regime that has been in power uh, in the United States way down under Trump, just as it was under Reagan. Uh, Reagan's presidency was called the anti-analytic presidency. He was not interested in data or in research evidence. And we see something very similar uh, happening right now. So these things come in waves. At some point, Trump will sail off into the distance or return to Manhattan, uh, and a new regime is likely to be more open to data and evidence, just as we've seen the transition happen in Canada. And then finally, even in an age of alternative facts, uh, evidence in some areas isn't contested. So in the US, abortion, climate change, good luck to you trying to introduce evidence into those types of debates. But there's a lot of public policy issues that are ripe for people bringing evidence to bear. Different interests and values can open up some areas to evidence. So Trump who allegedly was elected without being beholden to interests that typically finance a presidential campaign, has floated ideas of using cost-effectiveness analysis in drug coverage decisions. That was never possible under Obama, even though he wanted to do it. Uh, there were a variety of political reasons why it was very hard for him to do it. So paradoxically, under Trump, there might be areas where there's ways in for evidence that wasn't allowed at the table before. Some areas are off the radar, so he's focused on a lot of things, not focused on others. That means that existing norms about using evidence will likely remain. So until he or his political appointees get into those domains, good chance that evidence is going to continue to be used. And other areas just plain have hard to change rules about the use of evidence. And when we talk about policy making, about things like drugs, services, certain things that are easily routinized and there's been a well accepted way of making decisions, those things can be tough to change. Over two consecutive terms, it's quite possible they would change all of those rules. But it takes a long time for those political appointees to get a handle on all the processes and figure out how to go about making changes to them. So another figure. Uh, is in the world of public policy, folks like me are more focused on that bottom part of the policy loop. Policy about how do we organize ourselves to get the right programs, services, and drugs to the people who need them. But there's a lot of policy that happens about which clinical program, services, and drugs we pay for in the system, we actively support their use, and there's policy about which public health programs and services get widely used, which immunization programs, which do we invest in injection uh, drug uh, type services. Uh, those types of things are big public policy decisions. The, in the policy about health system arrangements, for me, uh, my view is that's the most complex one. The other two are much more easily routinized. So those ones have more established ways of making decisions. The policy about health system arrangements typically doesn't, and that's where folks like Trump can make the biggest disruptions the fastest. Of course, where he's currently trying to make the big changes are with Obamacare, the financing piece. But where Obama had the big impact certainly was on the financing, but a lot of the big changes and improvements in the US health system over the last decade have been on the delivery side. Obama didn't just change the subsidies and so on for insurance, he drove reform at the front and delivery side in ways that we have seemed to be incapable of doing in Canada. So that's the news about maybe it's not as dramatic a shift. But as I said before, I went through three lists that I sometimes use and asked the question, if we were facing a Trump in Canada, how disruptive would it be? So let me first take you through the 10 lessons uh, that we've learned over time about uh, supporting the use of evidence in government. One is be clear about the goal. So we believe we live in a democracy, evidence only one input, but we're trying to get evidence to play in decision making to help governments achieve what some people call the triple aim. 
So health systems are supposed to improve health, improve the patient experience, and keep per capita costs manageable. And evidence can be powerful in helping people figure out how to do that. We think it's important to use a systematic approach to analyzing priority issues, to unpacking problems and their causes, to thinking through options, to thinking through implementation. And some of the ways that we do it are because we've learned about what levers on the health system side make a difference, but some of them are because if we don't analyze it in a particular way, we don't go to the right database. So if it's about programs and services in the public health field, I know I have to go to Maureen's health evidence, but that database doesn't help me with non-effectiveness questions, and it doesn't help me with how do we organize ourselves to get the right public health programs and services to the people who need them. Looking for the right types of evidence, so benefits and harms, yes, systematic reviews of randomized trials, for example, but evidence about stakeholders' views and experiences with a problem, you'd go to a different place. Looking for the right places, same thing. Our advice to everybody is go to the sources of pre-appraised synthesized evidence. If it's about health systems, go to health systems evidence. If it's public health programs and services, go to health evidence. If it's about clinical programs and services or about drugs, go to ACCESS, the database that Alfonso and his colleagues maintain. Busy policymakers need to go to the right source of pre-appraised synthesized evidence when they need evidence. It's not conceivable that they will learn how to critically appraise evidence. Package the best evidence in the right format and on the right timeline. So we, Mike Wilson, in fact, who's here, runs a rapid response service for both the governments of Ontario and BC, best evidence in three, 10, or 30 business days. That's the kind of timelines government works on. We also do evidence briefs or citizen briefs, typically taking kind of a six to 10 week timeline. The shortest we've gone from a call from an associate deputy minister to a cabinet decision is seven weeks. Steering committee, terms of reference, 20 key informant interviews, evidence briefs, stakeholder dialogue, dialogue summary, personalized briefing, cabinet decision. We're increasingly though, if you look to point six, adding in citizen panels. So we create the evidence brief then write a plain language citizen brief, convene one to three citizen uh, panels, get their values about what should drive decision making, incorporate them into the final version of the evidence brief, and then have the stakeholder dialogue. And that changes the game because suddenly the stakeholders and the policy folks are sitting in the room with the best evidence, with citizen values, and now with their own insights to say, how are we gonna tell a compelling story to drive change in our system? Nine is make this the norm. Make it so that this is the default. Every time we make policy, we look for evidence in the right places and so on. That's the stuff that is hard for new governments like Trump to change. It sometimes will take years to get to them. Institutionalize it, make it the default mechanism. You are not supposed to be able to get to the Minister of Health in Ontario or to cabinet without filling out a research evidence checklist to document how you found and use evidence and to tell them which database you searched. And if you're proposing a new public health program, shame on you if you have not searched health evidence. And the people receiving those forms will know that. That's an example of institutionalizing the use of evidence. And finally, evaluate innovations, because we're not sure what's the most cost-effective way to support the use of evidence in policymaking. So those are our lessons learned, but when I went through them and I said, in the age of alternative facts, can any of these survive? And the answer is unfortunately no. If you are dealing with a regime like Trump, you are not trying for the same goal. You are not interested in a systematic approach to unpacking the issue. You are listening to the last person who you spoke to, or you're looking at the newspaper, or you're watching the news. You're not looking for evidence. You're not trying to engage citizens. Trump never has uh, town halls. Trump only speaks to people. He never engages folks in a dialogue. And similarly, make it the norm, what they will be doing over four or eight years is dismantling all the institutionalized processes. So lots of reasons why what seems to be getting a lot of traction in many countries around the world can be relatively easily undermined if you are working in a world of alternative facts. Briefly, same thing for Cochrane's new KT strategy. I am so excited about this new strategy. Cochrane 
in the business of driving action at the level of consumers, practitioners, policymakers, and doing it based on high quality reviews. And you'll see that there's six areas producing reviews that meet the needs of our users, ensuring they receive and can act on those products, growing their capacity to find and use those reviews, engaging with them to support their use and decision making through things like dialogues, advocating for the use of evidence and institutionalizing that type of work, uh, and building in a sustainable infrastructure. But in a world of alternative facts, all of that is for naught. In a, especially in a US system where the political appointees reach very far down into the executive branch, you will not find public policy people who will help you with the co-production of reviews, who would be willing to receive your overtures to hear about what the evidence means for them. So uh, thankfully, you know, as Paul said, we live in a world in which people are very uh, focused on evidence and, and the Cochrane KT strategy has a big opportunity for impact. I won't go through the forum's uh, quick summary given that I'm out of time. Let me just conclude by saying that a regime that embraces alternative facts unfortunately poses challenge to every one of our lessons learned, to every element of Cochrane's new KT strategy. And that's why I think people are so worried. But as Paul said before, we currently live in a world where our prime minister is very committed to evidence, at least on paper. Uh, we live in a province here in Ontario, many of us, where the government is quite committed to using evidence. Uh, and we have to focus on those jurisdictions where we have the opportunities for wins. But remember that evidence is only one piece. So it's not going to triumph under anyone, including under Trudeau, under Obama. The relative importance waxes and wanes for evidence over time in any given jurisdiction. So very bleak days for the United States right now, much more positive days for Canada, but those will reverse again over time. And even in an age of alternative facts, remember there's areas that we can always work. You're always gonna be able to take your evidence to somewhere and find opportunities to have an impact. It's not the case uh, that you can shake up the entire way that policy gets made uh, very rapidly. There's always gonna be opportunities. And if worse comes to worse, uh, you can always move to another country and take down their immigration server. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, next, we'll hear from Maureen Dobbins, who is, the, is a professor in the School of Nursing at McMaster University. Um, she's also the director, as, as, Paul, as John had mentioned, director of the Health Evidence uh, Database, uh, which is specifically targeted for public health uh, decisions, and um, also the scientific director of the National Collaborating Center of Methods and Tools um, through Public Health in Canada and also a woman at McMaster who does evidence-based uh, healthcare. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you from the public health side and uh, share some of the examples of uh, the different ways in which evidence uh, is or isn't being used in some public health decision-making. Start off with a couple of uh, images. I think sometimes we think, um, as we saw in one of John's slides, if we get the right information to the right people in the right way at the right time, that they'll use it. And sometimes we might be able to get them there, but we can't get them to drink the Kool-Aid with us. Or other times we just can't get them to really come with us to, to the water. So early days, I think, of the decision-making, our KT uh, world of research, we thought it was easier to get people to come, and if they came, they would uh, drink, drink the evidence, and now we know that isn't necessarily uh, the case. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, um, in terms of um, uh, the investment Canada has made, there are six centers uh, like mine in Canada across the country, all with a mandate to help the public health community use the best available evidence in many different areas from uh, environmental health to infectious diseases, determinants of health, um, healthy public policy, as well as Aboriginal health. And then uh, my centre, which has been funded for 10 years, has been to really help the public health community not only gain the knowledge and skills to use the best available evidence in decision making, but also to change the culture in which public health functions so that it becomes the norm to use evidence in practice. 
So this um, sums up a number of uh, John's uh, comments, uh, it, just using a picture format. This was originally created by uh, Dr. Haynes to be, Brian Haynes to be used with physicians. We've now modified it to be applicable for public health. But this um, really depicts what we're talking about in public health and many other areas around the complexity of decision making where research evidence really is only one part uh, of the decision making process. Part of what uh, my center has been trying to do is to make sure that this purple oval is part of the process in, on a regular basis. It, that isn't always necessarily the case. And that it's the best available that we have that influences or perhaps has a chance to influence decisions. But it becomes so much more complex when we think about the different uh, community and local contexts. And just thinking across Canada, a very large, diverse uh, uh, country something that might work here in Hamilton and be the best available evidence or intervention to implement here in Hamilton, when you take into account just the differences in local context across our country, that might not be the right intervention to implement elsewhere. Um, then across the country again as well, community and political preferences change the available uh, financial and human resources we have in different areas of the country, all of these uh, uh, folks in public health would think about as being evidence. So the word evidence is also a very challenging word to use and we need to be very clear about what kinds of evidence we are talking about. Um, but this diagram really just depicts that all of these things are taken into account. And, and as John said, very often um, the research evidence wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have the same amount of influence as this picture depicts. Everything looks equal here. That isn't necessarily the case. Most times the purple oval there is really quite a small um, influencer on that decision. So we need to keep that in mind, but we uh, need to have as a goal, how do we ensure that the best available is at least a part of the process every time. And so I've shown this before actually, and, and this sums up I think um, what, what some of the ways we can think about the evidence-informed decision-making process. Any of us who've been involved in, in conducting systematic reviews, meta-analyses, best practice guidelines know how much work that is. That's a lot, a lot of work by many people hours and hours, months and months of work to produce that evidence. And I would say in the world of evidence-informed decision-making, that's the part above the water of our iceberg in achieving evidence-informed decision-making. The really hard work of getting that evidence into practice is everything that's happening under the water. So some of the issues that we've seen um, that really impact uh, evidence-informed decision-making occur at an individual level, certainly with the public health decision-makers that I work with in Canada. We've, we have issues related to knowledge, skill, and capacity for being able to um, uh, critically assess their practice on an ongoing uh, basis, to uh, be able to turn practice-based issues into uh, researchable, answerable questions, to knowing where to look for that evidence so that they can access it uh, quickly and efficiently, to knowing what is good enough evidence to inform practice. Many don't come to public health with those skills. Um, and then being able to actually interpret that evidence within um, taking into account the local needs of their, the jurisdictions for whom they're providing services. So public health is particularly uh, challenging given that there isn't one undergraduate program that public health professionals come from. There's a wide variety of ways in which uh, the undergraduate education will lead you into a life of public health. And even at the, the graduate level, while we do have uh, many Masters of Public Health programs across the country, they vary considerably in the extent to which those graduates leave with this knowledge and skill to be able to use an evidence-informed practice. So we have challenges within not only the current workforce, but in the future public health professionals, where we've been slowly chipping away at improving that, that but it's a very large uh, task. And then we also have at the organizational level, context, culture, infrastructure, and also working with community partners. So we 
are now really emerging, I would say, into um, a time in public health where there's much more expectation than there ever has been before to demonstrate the use of uh, the best available evidence um, for staff to have those skills. Um, that's and particularly here in Canada. We have our new public health standards that were recently released that um, explicitly states in there that every health unit needs to demonstrate the use of evidence in the planning of their programs. However, there's still much to be done to ensure that the infrastructure and the mechanisms are in place to really support staff in being able to, uh, to achieve that. Furthermore, in public health, it's uh, not often that a public health department or health unit makes a unilateral decision about uh, service provision. Many times uh, the services they provide are in collaboration with community partners. So the health unit might be on board for, let's say, stopping a certain intervention for which we have long-standing evidence of its lack of effectiveness, but their community partners don't value that evidence and really, really want to keep that program going. So there's uh, additional challenges that public health also face. So I just want to leave you or talk about four examples um, that really take us over actually a couple of uh, decades that public health has uh, faced. They're both like the glass is half full and the glass is half empty type of approach in terms of the use of evidence and, and, and uh, how that really impacted the decisions that were made. If we actually uh, go back over 20 years, so around um, 1990, uh, anyone uh, who may have worked in public health at that time would have known that public health nurses in Ontario used to visit every first time mother in the province. Uh, and our chief medical officer of health at, uh, at that time uh, determined that uh, there was not evidence that supported that very expensive intervention. And so a decision was made to remove that intervention across the province. Uh, it, was, it coincided uh, at about the beginning of the Cochrane collaboration, and there were a group of us at Hamilton Public Health who had been working on a systematic review evaluating the effectiveness of public health home visiting interventions at about the same time that this uh, decision was made. So the province did move ahead with um, eliminating home visiting for first time mums. This review uh, came out um, shortly thereafter. The review demonstrated that there was overwhelming evidence of a positive effect in certain high-risk populations with a high-intensity uh, home visiting intervention. This review uh, was disseminated to various groups that were eventually successful in lobbying the government to reintroduce a new program that we still have today called Healthy Babies, Healthy Children. Um, it's always an interesting example that I use when talking with public health folks and, and uh, the undergrad and graduate students that I teach. A great example of is this evidence informed decision making because while the evidence was supportive in, and, and instrumental in bringing a program back, the program that came, that was implemented, actually didn't quite achieve what the evidence showed. So yes, uh, uh, a home visiting program was reintroduced. Uh, um, it wasn't done by public health nurses because that was uh, too costly at the time. And it wasn't done at the intensity or frequency or duration that the evidence supported. So yes, it brought back a program. It's had 20 years, or close to 20 years of being evaluated and an interesting concept in the use of evidence. I'll turn to another similar program, the Nurse Family Partnership Program, and my colleague, Dr. Susan Jack at, uh, in the School of Nursing at McMaster, uh, her whole program of research is in the implementation of this very evidence-based program. We have now decades of research that initiated with Dr. David Olds in the U.S. that a intensive, um, prenatal slash postnatal intervention for high risk adolescent mothers can be extremely effective in improving health outcomes for the mother, health outcomes for the baby, as well as other socioeconomic factors for mom and baby. They've now followed the babies from these early cohorts into their adult years and also see ongoing improvements in uh, income, 
uh, housing, other SES type of uh, interventions. So we have decades of research. We now see this program being implemented uh, across almost every U.S. state, uh, as well as uh, the province of British Columbia has adopted uh, this program, uh, as well as uh, funding the ongoing collection of research evidence to demonstrate its effectiveness. And this program also being adopted at a national level across many other countries in the world. One of the things that was, uh, that's truly outstanding about this example uh, is um, David Old's ability to, in the, in the, uh, still to this day, the research that's being done, which have all been done through randomized control trials, he would not let anyone get their hands on this program if they were not willing to uh, implement it with true fidelity to what he had proven to be effective as well as in also funding to keep doing randomized control trials around evaluating its effectiveness as it was being implemented in different jurisdictions or with different populations. And certainly that's what we're seeing in British Columbia as well. That there's, it's now, we're, they're now evaluating and assessing how do we alter this for more rural, rural and remote populations, First Nations populations, so the research can continue to inform uh, the program um, development. Another really good example is the Quit to Win uh, contest for smoking cessation. Uh, so any of you who've worked in public health here in Ontario and across the country would know that um, for more than 10 years this was uh, a public health program. Um, millions of dollars invested in running the Quit to Win contests uh, uh, over many, many years. In fact, it was, a, um, it, it was a position that many in public health really enjoyed doing. They love running these, being involved in, the, in these contests. Uh, and then we had some, a, a Cochrane Review that came out. It's about five or six years old now. A Cochrane Review um, published that indicated long-term effects uh, of quit and win contests showed that it was not an effective program. So we can get some short-term increases in cessation. 12 months later, we're really seeing no effect. So uh, Peel Public Health, which is in Mississauga, um, their medical officer of health at the time, Dr. David Mode, who is a huge advocate of evidence-informed decision-making and in public health, um, looked at that evidence, had his staff look at that evidence, they talked about it, um, didn't feel that the evidence was there to support their health unit being involved in the quit to win contest anymore. And despite this being included in the public health standards for Ontario, and there's a, a balance there of uh, the province sets the standards of what each uh, health unit is expected to deliver with respect to their interventions, and in return for delivering those, they pay for 75% of the public health uh, services. Um, so uh, David Mowat, in, indicated that we would no longer do this. Peel Public Health, cold turkey, quit doing their smoking cessation. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that off of there. Um, can we go back one? So they quit doing their quit and win. They, uh, the staff of the health unit were under um, a huge amount of pressure from other health units for why they had done this. So they could, uh, the Peel Public Health staff might be out somewhere at a conference presenting. Um, they were under fire from other health units, being challenged, why are you doing this? This is a great program, it, it is effective. Um, now what we're seeing is more and more health units started to adopt that, pushing back at the provincial level to say no, you know, the evidence again doesn't show that this works for what we consider to be the the ultimate outcome, which is at a population level, a reduction in smoking cessation. Interestingly enough, um, this has now, this is not as prevalent in the uh, public health standards in terms of an expectation that public health units will do this. However, many other jurisdictions across the country, other uh, groups continue to promote these. And what we start to hear is, well, um, it's, the goal isn't necessarily about the long-term outcome of smoking cessation, but about the number of times we can get people to quit. So maybe there is uh, some positive uh, effects that may come out of these. So we we're, we're also need to be cognizant of what are the relevant outcomes to different groups 
and those change over time as well. And so the last example um, that I'll talk about is fluoride. So all of us are likely aware of the ongoing challenges and debates that almost every jurisdiction in Canada has faced um, for at least a decade, if not more. If I, I know Peel Public Health best, in the past 10 years they have uh, been to council, this item has come up with council at least three times. And every jurisdiction, many health units in Ontario and across the country are on their own going to their various boards or councils um, to discuss what the evidence is about fluoride. And certainly what we've seen, um, if I just stop there for a moment and get us to think about the, the magnitude of resources that are being spent on this one topic alone every two to three years, uh, and they're all doing it independently of each other. So one, we do need a better way to be able to pool the resources of certain health units that have um, really spent significant time pulling together the evidence for and against and creating um, the presentations, the discussions for how to speak to different uh, decision makers about this, we need a better way to be able to share that so that we can stop this, um, everyone doing it on their own. Um, but what's interesting about this as, as well is with the same type of scientific evidence that does show a positive benefit of fluoride in the water um, and less uh, really poor quality evidence around what the uh, negative effects are. Um, um, there are different, very different decisions, as, as many of you will know, that have been made across the country and even here in Ontario. So certain jurisdictions removing fluoride, other jurisdictions have, have maintained fluoride. Um, I understand from Peel Public Health in their most recent interaction with council, they, they won again this time if we think winning means keeping fluoride in the water, but they are changing some of the elements that they're putting into the water. So this is a really good example of um, different evidence. The same evidence might lead to very different decisions um, that is being driven by those other bubbles. So the political preferences, community preferences, sometimes the resources, sometimes our geography. Some of the things uh, that we've learned along the way around the keys to success, um, I'll just share a few of those with you in terms of getting evidence into practice, and this is more at that service delivery uh, level for public health. So leadership and strategic direction. So certainly there are uh, some health units in the country that have definitely wanted to move in this direction, have invested heavily in changing the culture and the ways in which their organization makes decisions. That leadership is extremely important in terms of identifying that as key goals for an organization, but it goes beyond um, just uh, providing the money I truly believe it's related to the role modeling. So at the, from the very top of an organization, when someone sees their MOH, their medical officer of health, making a decision that is informed by the best available evidence and they can show that, that has a lot, that helps a lot in terms of throughout that organization staff wanting to follow in that direction. A shared vision of really what is evidence informed decision making Peel Public Health is eight years into a 10-year strategic plan for uh, changing itself into an evidence-informed uh, organization. About six years ago, I did a, a talk to the public health nurses there, which there's probably about 250 of them during Nurses Week, and many of them were still a bit confused about what that vision was. So how do we communicate really well so that everyone understands what we're talking about when we say the terms evidence-informed decision-making? I talk a lot about um, assessment, so we need to assess where individuals are, we need to assess where that organization is and start where they are at. They all have made some progress, both individually and organizationally, um, in the last uh, two decades. So let's build on the skills that they have as opposed to assuming we have to start from scratch. Tailoring the interventions um, 
you know, I remember reading back, or there's an, uh, an article that was published back in 1992 that was talking about the magic bullet of dissemination. And I think now we know we have adequate uh, evidence that tells us there is no magic bullet when it comes to knowledge translation. What we need to do is to really understand the various audiences that we are uh, working with, understand the ways in which they interact with each other, what are their social interactions, who are the influencers, and then we need to tailor our uh, interventions um, to address those social interactions. And, in, and with respect to uh, the last item, practice-based and relevant, I work with health departments to help them develop a process for implementing evidence into practice so that it's not just on this particular topic. So we want to do something about promoting physical activity in children. Well, that's fine to have an, a, a specific, let's say, research project or initiative to implement that evidence for that particular topic, but what about the 300 other topics that are out there? So we focus more on, across the board, what skills do folks need, what mechanisms need to be put in place so that for all decisions that are being made, this process can be um, used. So one of the things when you're trying to teach some of the basic skills and evidence-informed decision-making to public health professionals, um, we talk about keeping things as practice-based uh, and relevant as possible. We don't want the work of evidence-informed decision-making to be seen as an add-on. This is this extra thing that someone's making me do now. It's just part of how I do my job. So we get them to think about and identify at a senior level, what is a decision that your health unit has to make in the next, let's say, three to eight months um, and it shouldn't be the most important thing because if you're actually learning something new, it shouldn't um, be like something extremely important for your health unit, but it has to be important enough that someone's waiting for this evidence uh, so that they can make a decision about what to do. It'll be incorporated into the process of decision making. So we really work hard to help identify what are important issues at many levels, senior management, managers, because the managers are the gatekeepers for the time that staff will be allowed to do this. So helping them do that and knowing that there's a decision that someone's waiting for some evidence for as we take them through, let's say, uh, skills on developing or conducting a rapid review, they know there's something that makes this important. They can't give up the time uh, to actually invest in doing that activity. So I'll stop uh, there, and if there are any um, other questions about the National Collaborating Centre, I'd also be uh, happy to answer those. So we do have a few minutes for some questions or comments or experiences. Um, so if you do have any, um, there are microphones, uh, just one there. Um, there was one in the centre, I thought. Here, okay, so just on the two sides. So if anyone has any comments or experiences to share. Um, someone getting? Should I go for it? Sure, Al, uh, great, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome, you can give me the dollar later. Uh, <laughs> this one's for John specifically, although I guess I'd like Maureen and Paul's opinion on it too. And you brought up Melissa McCarthy, but I was more interested in Jennifer and sort of her thoughts on immunization and getting a lot of media coverage that immunization causes autism. And how do we battle that? You know, because, she, you know, she had a lot of impact, I would say. And, you know, people are still citing it. And I think it's difficult to have quick knee-jerk reactions to that. And the evidence on immunization obviously is older because it's been around for a while and we can't really prove, you know, that there aren't these adverse effects happening. So anyway, I just throwing that example out to you, I'd really like your input on it, maybe Maureen as well. Yeah, probably better for Maureen in the sense that I don't see many governments around the world not recognize that that link doesn't exist and not continuing to throw time and effort into immunization campaigns. So at the policy level, that type of stuff hasn't had the big impacts that one might have feared it would. I think where it, it plays out is at the more kind of frontline area, which Maureen knows much better than me, where public health practitioners are out there dealing this, with this on a regular basis. So Maureen, you probably thought long and hard about it. I don't know about long and hard, but um, I just came from a week-long workshop last week at McMaster with um, a group of public health professionals, and this did come up. 
uh, and even what should a health unit's response be when celebrities might be saying or anyone might be saying things that are uh, contradict what the health unit is, is suggesting and there's a difficult path they've spent time thinking about should we invest any time in trying to address this or do we continue on with just what our messaging is and being able to be clear about why their why their messages around immunization um, w what validates those so uh, our discussion last week was a little bit around in some instances it might be worth uh, working with their communication staff to to um, counter those messages. Most times they decide to not fight that fight um, in terms of thinking that won't be a good use of resources and continue on with the kinds of messaging they have. Other questions? Holger? Quick question for um, John and Maureen, perhaps. Um, um, so John, you you said the following, um, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, um, I tweeted it also, um, hopefully that paraphrasing was okay. You said that um, um, evidence hasn't been really used in policy, so we shouldn't be too ambitious. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what are the metrics um, um, that we can actually use to measure um, the use of evidence in policy, if you want to comment on that. And um, um, what, are, what are reasonable goals um, over a certain time frame? Um, any idea, comments on that? Or? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I guess to my comment was more that it's not consistently used uh, across all jurisdictions and over time and across all issues. So there's going to be times where interest group pressure trumps the evidence on particular issues. Um, and right now we're seeing the U.S. at the federal government level in a period where it has little to no prospects. So I think it changes over time. Uh, in terms of impacts, the trouble in the policy world is that to truly document evidence use, the, the gold standard are case studies that uh, involve not just media analyses and documentary analysis, but interviews with people that were behind closed doors. Because we, it's very hard from the outside to distinguish a true use from what's sometimes called the political use, where a decision was made for other reasons, and then people were asked to find the evidence to back up that point. Those case studies are labor intensive. Uh, we've done many of them. Mike Wilson has done many of them. Uh, sometimes evidence gets used. It's the defining feature. Other times it's part part of the parcel, other times it doesn't get used and we try to identify patterns. Um, but we can do lighter touch things. So an example would be we worked with the minister's uh, chief political aide and uh, went through all of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in Ontario, their documents over the last 10 years that were produced by expert review groups. And it was a really disappointing story. The expert review groups are very much what Paul described, the typically old white men sitting in a room, not with any supporting evidence, and not required to base their recommendations on evidence. And the most galling example to me was a major review of home and community care. Uh, they cited only one systematic review and it was about primary care, but we have more than 500 systematic reviews about how do we improve home and community care. H how could a blue ribbon panel in Ontario recommend changes to such an important sector with no evidence base? So we can do documentary reviews and other things that point out clear disjunctures. So uh, I guess my main message is it waxes and wanes over time. Ontario, as one example, has made big improvements. We can use very resource intensive approaches to measuring whether we're having a, uh, an impact, but we can also use lighter touch approaches. And unfortunately, even the lighter touch approaches show there's a lot of room for improvement. Any other questions at all? I'm, I'm just wondering about, many of you had mentioned Health Canada, the health units, um, and I'm, I'm imagining some people have experience with that, and, and I'm just thinking of the, the process that's happening there, and uh, maybe some experiences that you've had, or um, ways to improve, or some success stories even. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to get us into trouble? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, success too is also yeah. good. I, I mean, I, I guess a success is the funding of the of the National Collaborating Centre. So the the National Collaborating Centres, the NCCs, came about as a result of SARS and the inquiries into SARS. One of the um, 
key factors identified was a lack of uh, knowledge and skill in the public health workforce to be able to use the best available evidence. Um, and that led to the development of the NCCs, which has not been a small investment. Um, I, I think we're probably at about $70 million that have been invested uh, in those centers over the years. And um, there really aren't, from my travels anyway, there aren't centers, uh, too many other centers like that around the world that are producing freely available resources that are there to help the public health workforce gain easier access to the best available evidence as well as uh, learn how to put that into, into practice as well as help change the culture of, or, of public health to be able to use those. Um, that being said, uh, you know, coming back a bit to your question, Holger, of like how do you measure impact? So we're asked all the time huge expectations to be able to demonstrate how we are changing the face of public health. Um, while 10 years is a long time, it's also a short time, and we are a very large country, and in the individual centers really have uh, relative, they we're all pretty small. So our ability to really be able to show significant change in what, what is an important outcome to our funder versus to our target audience, which is frontline public health, don't always match up very well. So there definitely was, is, is the interest, an ongoing interest, it appears, to, to have these centers, um, although it's always a bit changing in terms of what the expectations are upon us and um, show impact but don't use resources to actually get that data on showing the impact. Just a, a quick comment. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, there's different types of policy. Health Canada, um, you know, when it comes to deciding or to informing decisions about which drugs in particular, they do a good a, a job. They have the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board that decides which drugs are allowed to be marketed for sale in Canada. They support the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Therapeutics and Healthcare, which has a very robust set of processes that inform provincial level decision making, where we don't, in my part of the world, see strengths at the federal level is decisions related to health system arrangements. So I see neither the leadership in the Public Health Agency of Canada nor in Health Canada. You could argue that their view is this is provincial jurisdiction, but they're putting money into home care, mental health and addictions, other areas where one would uh, expect them to be upping their game in this area. So I think they're doing lots of very good work at policy at the level of drugs. Uh, I think they could up their game very dramatically in the policy making about how to we get those drugs to the people who need them? Paul, any comments? Yeah, nothing positive about Health Canada, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, I think my experience with Health Canada, of course, it varies as to which group you're speaking to. The only group I have experience with is the GI group, of course. Um, and there, it's, it's just very disappointing. It's the, the Jennifer McCarthy view of, of evidence. So, when I was trying, when I first came here, we went to try and get the concept that not everyone needs an endoscopy before you start treatment and that test and treat should be available. You know, informally, of course, it is, but um, in, on, in a Health Canada perspective, any drug you give has to be preceded by an endoscopy for upper GI disease, which is clearly ridiculous. And um, I thought, well, I'll show them the evidence. It's absolutely compelling. So their view was that if you have upper GI symptoms, you may have cancer, so you need an endoscopy to uh, prove that you don't. Now, I'm a gastroenterologist. This is how we make our money. We, and this is why gastroenterologists love it, because they get paid well for endoscopy. They get poorly. Rel relative to that, they get paid less well for actually seeing patients and helping them. So I, I think they've basically been listening to a lot of uh, pressure groups in gastroenterology saying endoscopy is good. Uh, and so I point out that in a 20-year-old with heartburn, the chances of them having uh, any sort of cancer is less than one in a million, right? So why you can't possibly justify endoscopy? We don't need health economic calculations. You just shouldn't do it. Uh, and uh, so they accepted that evidence but said, we still feel you should, yeah? 
It's all about, as you were saying, John, uh, beliefs of that group, which in turn was pressurized by, I think, pressure groups that make income from doing that procedure that is, frankly, in most young people, irrelevant. Uh, so it's just disappointing. I've not got any positive stories, I'm afraid, in that, in that realm. <laughs> Um, so any I, other questions before we I did oh, have a second there. question yeah, sure. there. that's why I, the only reason why I was standing up and Paul you you almost you you brought the topic there um, so you, you were imp implicitly speaking about conflicts of interest basically for most of the um, um, most of the examples that you or many of the examples that you cited um, um, and that you refer to now as well and there there has been a lot of work on on um, understanding and declaring and managing conflicts of interest in guidelines um, in particular. Uh, um, your examples indicate that um, um, despite all of that and despite of publicly available databases in the US, um, it doesn't really work because these conflicts, um, um, conflict driven um, 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 opinions um, still make it to the to the top journals and are disseminated widely and and there are conflicts at play even for the examples that you described so long introduction so we I think we've done we've dealt with with methods on a guideline level what I'm wondering about is what we've done with um, um, with some um, patients and citizens to actually make them aware um, better aware um, that um, um, recommendations are heavily influenced, remain heavily influenced by potential conflicts. And I'm sure that there are lots of patients and consumers in the, in the room. Um, um, my impression is we haven't done that well um, um, in that particular area. And that's why um, there's not enough pressure. Um, um, and that's why those type of examples continue to exist. Any thoughts about that um, from anybody of you really? So making others aware of it um, what I'd like is if Maureen was would be willing to talk about the web resource trader from to the McMaster optimal aging portal because th that is partly what you're trying to do. Sure. Uh, so with the McMaster optimal aging portal that uh, John and I and Alfonso uh, our three databases uh, form the basis of the evidence that's the scientific evidence but what we're also doing is uh, searching um, the world for um, information that's available online, so through the internet. And we've created a tool to assess the quality of the use of evidence, research evidence in the production of that information, as well as um, how easy it is to use that information and the transparency of, of who's created that information. And we're, um, I mean, what we're trying to do is to make available or to, to help the public gain access to uh, online resources that are evidence-based to assist them in their, in their decision making. So I'm along those lines, but a little di different. I mean, GRADE has been very successful. Um, I would say where we are at the moment we're where we were with randomized trials in the sort of 60s and 70s or 70s and 80s so that everyone accepts it now they were very suspicious to start i think most people are very happy to get involved many do it badly some do it well and but in time they'll all do it well i hope just as now randomized trials are a lot more rigorous than they were uh, in the 80s uh, so I think a similar thing should be done for conflict of interest. It doesn't have to be the same group, it can be a different group, but conflicts occur in all sorts of ways. Politicians have huge conflicts of interest. Um, everyone does. Um, uh, you know, I'm now in a discomforting position of putting drug companies up on, on the conflicts thing because I now have a SPORE grant, which uh, a different one from the one we're going for, where we've got industry partners. They have no influence on the, uh, on the protocol or any IP. They're essentially doing it out of the goodness of their heart, and pharmaceutical companies occasionally do that, but suddenly that's a conflict of interest to me. Whereas for me, the far more relevant conflict of interest is, first of all, big pharma funding to you, which some individuals get, and is just criminal, in my view. Secondly, um, uh, the, uh, our, how our practice uh, or our income from our practice is influenced by the um, uh, 
thing we're recommending, but also our value. So British gastroenterologists in the UK, where I come from, you're paid a salary. Uh, and as long as you don't work in the private healthcare sector, it doesn't matter if you do one endoscopy a year or a thousand, no, a thousand, ten thousand, uh, you'll get paid the same. So in theory, there should be no conflict of interest. But of course, if I'm used to scoping, I want to show value in that. So there's going to be conflicts. That's harder to show. But what's easy to show is what income from what you make from what you're recommending. And I think we should be transparent across the board, not just pharma, which is what we all focus on, where actually there are only there are a few in every specialty, but there are a few who are egregiously criminal about what they do, but most are fine. The bigger problem, I think, is, is inherent bias related to what we do. And I, I think a group uh, should pressure everyone into reporting this explicitly. As soon as you have to do that, it becomes a lot more uncomfortable to say endoscopy should be for everyone when you report that it's 80% of your income. Okay, that's great. Um, I don't know, Holger, did you want to say anything? Thank you to our speakers. Uh, that was very nice. Thank you. Um, did, did you want to say anything more about the program? I'm not sure if we want to um, ask people. Um, can you hand me that program? Sure. Thanks. So uh, we will have a break, um, and then we do have some oral sessions and workshops afterwards. Um, then we have our lunch, and we will have all of the posters set up outside, so we invite you to have a look at those. Um, after lunch, we have our longer educational uh, education sessions, and we had asked people to possibly uh, sign up before. Um, I don't, um, is there, I'm just wondering if some of the workshop leaders might be able to just stand up now and uh, give a brief uh, you know, two-liner about their workshop, just in case some people haven't yet signed up for any of those. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, your group, is there someone who might want to speak about that? Um, Holger, I think, uh, did you want to just say a brief blurb? Our workshop is about um, great evidence to decision frameworks, and essentially what we will be doing is um, introducing the evidence to decision frameworks and have some uh, hands on um, 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 experiences and practice with the evidence to decision frameworks. This work goes back, obviously, to work with the great working group. Um, 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 making or trying to make um, um, decisions that um, range from um, simple clinical practice um, guidelines to more complicated um, health policy type of decisions more transparent based on um, specific criteria and the workshop will be um, co-moderated by Ray Zhang and um, um, Carlos Coelho. John, you're sitting here. Yep. You're Using evidence in policy making, so very often consumers and practitioners don't have a sense about how these big policy decisions get made and whether and how there's a way in for evidence into that process. Uh, so we're going to be walking you through the training that we provide to policy folks. Um, we've now provided the training to about 500 public servants in Ontario, thousands of people around the world. So it's it's three and a half hours broken up by a break with a chance to actually see how it works. How do how do policy people think about problems and think about evidence about those? How do they think about options? How do they think about implementation? So no previous policy experience required, but we'll give you a flavor for what's happening and therefore how you can try and influence that process. And I don't know, if, is Lena here? Is Lena? Yes, Lena. Can you talk loud enough from back there? Yeah. Mm. It's very quiet. Maybe Lena, I think you might need the mic. <laughs> Our workshop is about practical strategies for uh, citizen and patient engagement in the development and conduct of systematic reviews. 
uh, a systematic review by Concanon suggested that there is very little stakeholder activity and particularly patient engagement activity in systematic reviews. We actually believe that that's not the case. We believe that part of the issue is that people are not reporting these types of activities. So we've set up um, a workshop to talk about these issues and we have a number of practical exercises so people can really uh, think about some of these issues when doing systematic reviews. Thanks, Lena. And then is there, uh, from the last uh, workshop, is Su Susanna Watson, is she here? yet? Maybe not? Or uh, Sarah? I'm here. Okay, I'm Susanna. very good. Okay, perfect. So uh, Sarah and I are from the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, which we just heard a little bit about. So part of the work that we do is translating the highest quality available evidence about healthy aging into easy to understand blog posts and plain language evidence summaries. Um, I mean, we believe that this is important uh, for people to they're more likely to act on and use the evidence if they can understand it and it's relevant to them. Uh, so this afternoon at the workshop, we're going to teach you how to take a closer look at a systematic review, a little hands-on activity where you can uh, learn how to pull out the relevant messages for uh, target groups and be able to interpret this and communicate it uh, in concise and plain language. So if you're interested, please join us. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you very much.